Okay, for our last presentation, we've got Mike Carroll talking about using uh, open sound control hardware and software in ROS, I think specifically with the Apple devices. And you're gonna to wanna to stick around just, just for after this presentation. It's a little bit longer. We do, uh, we do have another announcement. They're uh, raffling off a of PR2, right? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so like he said, my name is Michael Carroll, and I have, to, uh, I have to thank Ryan and Matt for letting me drive the Husky around earlier with the iPhone. So that's, about, that's what I'm about to show you here. Um, so it is somewhat safe. We almost went turtle butt bowling there for a second, but it all, uh, it all came out all right. So uh, I'm with Auburn University. I'm a grad student in electrical engineering there. The contact information, I think all this stuff is hosted on my website. You can take a look at it there. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm going to sort of avoid hardware demonstrations. You can meet up with me after the presentation, and we can, uh, we can look at all this stuff. And there's also YouTube videos, and it's all fully documented on the wiki, so I get a gold star from Melanie, wherever she went. So you can uh, check, check all that out on the ross.org wiki. So the first thing everybody asks me is, what, what is the sound, open sound control? What does it have to do with ROS? So open sound control is actually a protocol developed by UC Berkeley. It's a very, very, very thin protocol. It's uh, sort of designed as a spiritual successor to MIDI. In fact, uh, it can sort of encapsulate all of the MIDI specification inside of it. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, MIDI is the, I think, musical instrument data interchange format. Um, they came up with it, I think, in the mid-80s, and it hasn't evolved at all since then. So I think it's, uh, I think it's got like 16-bit uh, numbers, integers, for representing uh, music and things like that. So it's intended for sharing musical performance data, so gestures, uh, note sequences, uh, these sort of things. So the protocol kind of looks like this. It's uh, transport independent. Uh, it's kind of got your Unix namespacing that we're kind of familiar with seeing using a whole bunch of ROS. Uh, the transport independent means it can go over TCP, UDP. I know a lot of people are sending it over the wire doing uh, things like Arduino uh, or in as a replacement for DMX, so over like RS-422 and RS-485. So uh, it's, it's really just kind of a cool, simple little protocol that's sort of fun to use. One of the other things that it has, it has support for bundles of messages. So these are kind of, if you think of it as a ROS message, um, things that are meant to be uh, executed simultaneously, which you could imagine is fairly important in musical performances. So why use OSC? Why is this interesting? Why is it interesting to us as robotics researchers? Uh, so it's kind of gained a lot of traction in the musical community for these kind of novel gesture, multi-touch, tangible interfaces. So uh, two of the big ones there are uh, TUIO, which is what this kind of is down here on the bottom right. It's the, that's the React table. That's on the list of things to buy with my first paycheck, I think. Um, so that's a super huge uh, Microsoft Surface knockoff. It's all open source, um, but all of its data is actually encapsulated in this OSC format. So what they're doing there, I think this is actually a synthesizer where they're dropping different modules on um, to control how music is synthesized. Uh, this is the mono, which I think if you've been on the internet for any length of time, you've probably seen big uh, square tons of push buttons. I think uh, several, several musicians use that in concert. Um, but there's a lot of people out there building these, these kind of hardware, uh, hardware interfaces that use OSC. Sort of uh, how I found out about it and how I got interested in it is Touch OSC, which is this um, iPod and uh, iPad application. And it allows you to create these virtual kind of control panels. So you can put together knobs and sliders and buttons and uh, all sorts of fun things like that into any sort of layout that you want to make. Um, so some of the kind of interesting parts of it, it uses Bonjour and ZeroConf for all of its configuration. So that's how it finds other computers. I know there's kind of been a lot of rumblings of using ZeroConf or Avahi or um, depending on whatever platform you use. In ROS, it's, uh, it's very, very cool because you don't have to have DHCP. Everything just sort of resolves magically using just hardware addresses. Um, it supports custom control layouts. You load them right over to your iPad or your iPod, um, and you can start using them right away. It's actually created by uh, RJ Fisher, who calls himself Hexler, I believe. Um, so this is sort of an example layout. It gives you an idea of all the different controls that are available. Uh, you have XY pads, labels, multi-toggle, multi-touch, faders, um, and rotary knobs. You can have uh, up to 25 of these layout, uh, tab pages in a single layout. So uh, there's a little tab bar at the top. It's kind of faint in the, in the projector here. But you can have uh, 
up to 25 different kind of views of the same system. So when I saw this, I kind of got to thinking, you know, I want to use it for robotics because it's totally awesome to drive robots with iPads. Um, and it makes our advisors really, really happy and project sponsors really, really happy. So um, just sort of to give you an idea, it's sort of the same things that we discussed in the, uh, in the field robotics thing uh, yesterday. You know, a lot of times we have these use cases for robots that I think Ross might be a little, a little generally weak on, um, but, but we need as, a, as doing field robotics. So users want to be able to easily move their robots around. That's a, that's a big one. Uh, so I don't know how many of you have done a lot of work with the Department of Defense, but it seems like their minimum OCU size is about the size of a suitcase, um, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense considering, you know, we carry around these things in our pockets that are just about as powerful as the Pentium M's or whatever that we're shipping out um, for defense projects. And so I want to be able to walk into the lab, I want to be able to turn this robot on, I want to drive it out the door, and I want to get to where I want to go and collect my data without doing an immense amount of console work or anything like that. Um, additionally, I want to be able to monitor hardware diagnostic information, and I want to be able to do it right there on the spot. And there's a lot of tools built into ROS. We've heard about how all of us should be using diagnostics in our hardware drivers, which we do. I don't know. Uh, so I, I, I get a gold star from Chad, too. Gold stars all around. Um, so, you know, I want to be able to monitor voltages. Uh, a critical one with the lawnmower in Alabama is temperatures, um, you know, currents, also GPS satellites, IMU, uh, calibration status, all these things like that. <clears throat> Additionally, I want my manager to be able to come in and figure out what's going on very, very, very quickly, which is, which is good. Um, in my case, my advisor, you know, he wants to be able to come in and say, you know, what is it doing? And I want to be able to go here, hold the iPhone, stand over here. You can see it. Um, this is going on YouTube, right? So, sorry, Dr. Gnomes. Um, <laughs> and then, additionally, teams want to work on the same robot without interfering. Um, so, in my case, you know, I might be interested more in electrical hardware, and William is more interested in what the software is doing. And uh, it's kind of hard to figure all that out while um, huddled over the same computer in a shack in the middle of the field in Alabama. So. Um, Kind of my solution is ROS OSC. So this gives you the ability to interact with both hardware and software um, open sound control devices. Uh, so the Monome, the Reactivision, um, or, or Touch OSC. It's a stack that consists of a couple different packages. I'm going to run through them real quick uh, so you can get an idea of what each of them do. Um, PyTouch OSC is basically just a ROS independent Python library for interacting with this Touch OSC layout file. So it allows you to kind of construct and manipulate these layout files that you want to load to the Touch OSC device. Um, comes with a couple command line tools. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, it also gives you the ability to load the uh, layouts onto the device programmatically through a ROS node, which is a lot more helpful than the um, Java editor that it originally comes with. Um, so the very, very basic part of the communication is this OSC bridge. This is what you would want to fire up if you want to interact with OSC hardware. This works with both TCP and UDP. Um, I tested it with a Wiimote. I know there's already a Wiimote node in ROS, but that was the only, um, only OSC hardware that I have available. I gladly take hardware donations. Um, I can get you my address after the talk. Um, so basically all this does is it does the, the basic cross-strapping between the ROS protocols and the OSC protocols and makes sure everything starts up and shuts down the way it's supposed to. And it also does all of its bonjour registration which I recently found out somebody has already done in ROS, um, so I might have to switch over to that. Um, so when you fire up your iPhone, if you're using, uh, say, Touch OSC, uh, the bonjour allows it to just show up in a list. You click, and everything uh, auto configures itself. Auto configures itself, picks out host name, port, everything. You don't have to remember any of that, which is always super convenient. So actually interacting with these tab pages. Um, I have what's called a default tab page handler, so you give it just a layout file. It provides a layout server. You can get it on your iPhone, and if you can finish the ROS tutorials, then you can move sliders and dials and get information back from the user of the phone. Super simple. Um, it's, it's basically, I think, 25 lines of code, and I did uh, plotted out the accelerometer data from the iPad on the display on the iPhone. So there's a YouTube video. You can look it up. Um, it's, it's, it's fairly simple. Um, in addition to these, this default handler, I also have sort of these named views of the robot. 
So the first one is uh, teleop, and that's what we were doing earlier with the Husky when it sort of uh, went bowling for turtle bots, as we're calling it. Um, it works with holonomic and differential robots. I drove the PR2 in simulation because um, the raffle's coming up next, right? Okay. So, um, and it's also got mutual exclusion on the controls, so nobody can take control from another person. And then um, all of the all of the clients actually see what the the guy in command is doing. Um, Additionally, there's a diagnostics handler. Let's see if we can blow that up. Yes. Okay, so there's a diagnostics handler because all of us have diagnostics on our robots and we want to be able to see them. So this is kind of what that looks like. You get a nice little list, shows all the hardware that's running. Not very much here considering it was running on my laptop at the time and not on a robot. Um, and you get big status LEDs, which are good for your project, uh, project sponsors and advisors. So um, green is good, yellow is not good, and red is really bad. So um, anybody can understand that. So uh, some of the limitations, Touch OSC is UDP only, so it's not really super reliable. Um, that being said, I drive around the lawnmower with it, and if you have a 325 pound machine with cutting blades on the front of it, um, I still have all my toes, William still has all his toes, and there aren't really big holes in the walls in brown. Um, so everything is okay. It's, it's reliable enough, I guess you could say. Um, OSC Bridge does actually support both UDP and TCP, so if you have a device that is TCP, you can do it that way. Um, the custom layouts, there is an Android app, so before you go to the Android store and buy the Android version of TouchOSC, it does not support custom layouts. So um, that's kind of, a, kind of a big drawback. Don't waste your $4 or whatever that the app costs. So we are sort of reliant on an external developer for updates for that. Um, that being said, there is an iOS SIG um, that I actually discovered today. So if anybody is interested in maybe the future of ROS on iOS devices, you should go to the um, Groovy planning page and sign up there. Uh, that should be getting off the ground here in the next couple days. Um, and then I guess the other limitation is that it's only Python. I don't really see that as a limitation because I'm not a huge fan of C++, but you know some people might be a bit disappointed. Um, so current status, everything that I showed you here today does work. Um, so there are video tutorials, there are actual tutorials on the ROS wiki, um, and all of the wiki pages and documentation is all auto-generated the way it's supposed to be. Um, and then over this summer I plan on adding kind of an interface for ROS bag, application management, um, and then some more GUI tools for uh, layout manipulation and things like that. So with that, kind of breeze through there so everybody can get on their way. Uh, do you have any questions?